In the next two lectures, we'll be going over spinal cord neuroanatomy, and then later on we'll have a lecture um, emphasizing the clinical aspects of the spinal cord. So just as a big picture, we've already discussed that uh, with regards to the spinal cord, we have a cervical 1 through 8 segment, then thoracic 1 through 12, lumbar 1 through 5, and then uh, sacral. The conus medullaris here um, usually ends about L1, sometimes even at uh, T12. So this one is drawn a little low here, right? But then remember, we have all of the nerve roots. So we have nerve roots coming out from the lumbar spine. So for example, here would be the L5 nerve root, which has to travel all the way down here to exit, and then the sacral nerve roots. And of course, this all together makes up the cauda equina. Um, the spinal cord has the same coverings that the brain has. So we have the pia, the arachnoid, the dura, and we can have the same things involve the spinal cord that involve the brain, like a subdural epidural hematoma after trauma. And if we get a closer look up here, um, we can see that the most common things that affect the spinal cord would be um, disc herniation, or sort of an encroachment on the nerves from uh, degenerative changes and calcium buildup. Those are called osteophytes, which can compress the nerve roots that exit here, okay? but they can also compress the spinal cord. So we often see um, lesions around here affecting both the nerve roots, okay, giving the patient a radiculopathy. And remember that the nerve root here is a lower motor neuron, so we may have some lower motor neuron findings. But... If it compresses the spinal cord, we will discuss a lot of upper motor neuron pathways travel in the spinal cord. So a lesion in one place here can sometimes be rather confusing because we'll get a combination of upper and lower motor neuron findings in the same patient. And as we'll see, there aren't too many things in neurology that can do that. All right, so this is a section of the spinal cord at T1. And we'll just sort of give you a big picture overview of um, some of the pathways that we'll talk about. First, let's go through sensory pathways. So notice here we have coming into the dorsal root ganglion right here, um, some larger fibers. These are myelinated. Okay, and uh, notice that these are traveling after going through the dorsal root. They're going up through the posterior column. So we have the posterior or sometimes called, called the dorsal columns. And so we have a medial portion called the fasciculus grossalis, a lateral portion called the fasciculus cuneatus. And these, uh, the fibers in the posterior columns convey um, largely vibration and proprioception. All right, so notice these come in without synapsing and they just head right on up to the brain. And uh, the columnar arrangement, again, this is a drawing at T1. So notice as the fibers enter, they come in on this aspect here. So the sacral fibers are lateral, and then they get laid down to lumbar, thoracic. And if we had a, a section of the cervical cord here, we would see cervical fibers coming out here laterally. All right, the pain and temperature fibers come in through small, relatively unmyelinated fibers. And notice here we have a synapse at the, um, the largely th the substantia gelatinosa in the dorsal horn. We'll discuss that later. And notice the difference here is these fibers cross over and then ascend here in this pathway, the spinothalamic tract. Now notice here we have exactly the opposite columnar arrangement. Here we have the thoracic fibers more medial and the lumbar and sacral fibers more lateral. Okay, and so again, if we were to have a cervical cord drawing, we would see these, the cervical fibers entering here more medially. This does have some clinical applications, uh, understanding the columnar arrangement, um, as we'll see uh, later. All right, so those are the two main ascending sensory pathways. Um, we have a large pathway here, and this is the lateral cortical spinal tract. Okay, and notice it has the same columnar arrangement as the spinothalamic tract, okay, with the thoracic and cervical fibers here, medial, um, and then lumbar and sacral fibers being lateral. So um, this is our uh, 
when we talk about upper motor neuron findings and all of that, um, this is the pathway we'll usually refer to. This is our most dominant uh, upper motor neuron pathway for lesion localization. Now out here laterally, we have um, two pathways that are headed up to the cerebellum. As the name indicates, they are spinocerebellar tracts. So they're going from the spinal cord up to the cerebellum. And so here we have a dorsal and a ventral spinocerebellar tract. We'll explain those later. Uh, notice also that anterior horn cells are located right here in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And so it is kind of interesting here in the brain, we discussed how the cortical neurons are located out around peripherally. Um, the white matter pathways are deeper. Um, here we have all these neurons here in the center and the pathways that travel out around the periphery. So the anterior horn cells, uh, sometimes called alpha motor neurons, these are the uh, lower motor neurons, okay? And so the nerve roots come from each of these anterior horn cells. Okay, the other nucleus we see here is Clark's nucleus. Clark's nucleus, for now, just associated with the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. We'll explain how that works later. Okay, but this is a essentially a relay nucleus for the dorsal spinocerebellar tract, and we're mainly just going to see this in the thoracic cord sections. All right, so when you're looking at just sections of the spinal cord, you want to have a big picture idea of what level am I looking at. And so what do you notice here as a difference between these two sections? Well, maybe the most obvious is look at all the neurons here in this section. These are all anterior horn cells compared to over here where we have relatively few. So why would we need more anterior horn cells? Well, there must be a lot of muscles supplied at this level. And so this is C8 of the spinal cord. And C8 um, supplies so many muscles, especially down um, in and near the hand. So we need lots of anterior horn cells. This is T6 of the spinal cord. Very few anterior horn cells because what muscles are supplied at T6? You've just got some intercostal muscles. Uh, we don't need a lot of anterior horn cells. So that is one of the um, most obvious things. If we're looking at a section, we can usually identify the thoracic cord because of this small number of uh, lower motor neurons. Now there are two nuclear groups that uh, we see mainly in the thoracic cord, sometimes down to L1 or L2. Okay, One of them we've already discussed here is Clark's nucleus, which is right there. Okay, this is the only nucleus I would ask you to identify right here. So that's Clark nu Clark's nucleus, and remember we associate this with the pathway out here, the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. The other thing that's unique in the thoracic cord is we have this little jetting out right here nucleus. This is the intermedial lateral cell column. Okay, and these are the preganglionic sympathetics. Okay, remember parasympathetics. We call them craniosacral. They exit with cranial nerves and they exit in the sacral spinal cord. The sympathetic preganglionic neurons um, come out mainly from the thoracic cord and again sometimes down to T1 or down to L1 or L2. So first let's go through the descending upper motor neuron pathways. So we'll discuss the lateral motor system first and two pathways, the lateral cortical spinal tract and the rubrospinal tract. So first, the lateral cortical spinal tract. Probably no pathway we will talk about in this course more than the cortical spinal tract. So it's located right here, okay? And uh, this uh, supplies anterior horn cells throughout the entire length of the spinal cord, but you can see half of the fibers synapse on the cervical spinal cord more than the thoracic and lumbosacral. So that means that the cortical spinal tract is more invested in the upper extremity and its strongest action is actually fine motor control of the hand. So when you're, you know, typing, writing, playing a musical instrument, the cortical spinal tract would be very much involved in that. And again, remember the columnar arrangement. We have the sacral and lumbar fibers laterally and then thoracic and cervical fibers medially. So here's a big picture again of the cortical spinal tract. We've been over this already, but uh, this couldn't be emphasized too much from my perspective. 
So we have the neurons here from the precentral gyrus traveling down as the cortical spinal tract. Okay, and remember they cross right at the junction here between the medulla and the spinal cord as the pyramidal decussation. And then they descend on the opposite side of the spinal cord. Again, it's cortical spinal tract the whole way. Um, clinically, when you hear neurologists talk about the cortical spinal tract, we're referring to this pathway. Even more technically, it is the lateral cortical spinal tract. Okay, and so it's talking to anterior horn cells, and it does so through a little interneuron here. Okay, this has some more uh, details here. Um, so here is the cortical spinal tract coming from the medial hemisphere. So what part of the brain would that be? That's the paracentral lobule. And so remember that supplies your leg. And so we can follow these fibers down as they go through the posterior limb of the internal capsule, through the cerebral peduncle, through the basis pontus. They cross here at the pyramidal decussation in the medulla. And this is going to go all the way down to anterior horn cells um, in the lumbosacral area to move your leg. All right. Um, the, for the arm, this is here in blue, again traveling through the posterior limb, through the cerebral peduncle, through the basis pontus, crossing in the pyramidal decussation, and now supplying anterior horn cells in the cervical cord to move your hand. Okay, the other pathway shown here, but not identified, this is the cortical bulbar tract, which really is just the same thing. It travels right along with the cortical spinal tract. Uh, remember, this goes through the genu of the um, internal capsule. But if we follow the cortical bulbar tract down here in purple, notice that it is supplying lower motor neurons in the brainstem. Okay, so we give it a different name, the cortical bulbar tract, but this whole pathway, cortical spinal and cortical bulbar, are supplying all of the lower motor neurons in the brainstem for the cortical bulbar tract and in the spinal cord, which is the cortical spinal tract. Now the rubrospinal tract does essentially the same function as the lateral cortical spinal tract, much less important, but we've seen the red nucleus right here in the midbrain, and so the rubrospinal tract originates from the red nucleus. And it supplies, again, a more of an emphasis on the hand, um, just like the cortical spinal tract. Okay, and so when we call this the lateral motor system out here, we have the lateral cortical spinal tract and the rubrospinal tract. And so they are supplying anterior horn cells here. And uh, to mainly emphasize here that a lot of this has to do with your arm and hand control. Yes, the leg as well, but you know, a little bit more in the arm and the hand. We'll contrast this with the medial motor system here in blue, and you can see that this has more to do with more proximal truncal midline musculature. All right, so in the medial motor system, we'll talk about four pathways here. Uh, vestibulospinal tract, we'll actually talk about two vestibulospinal tracts, the tectospinal tract, the reticulospinal tract, and we have an anterior cortical spinal tract, much less important than the lateral cortical spinal tract. But these all travel um, here in this region. And you can see by the name, um, you know, they all end in spinal tract. So they're all going to the spinal cord, and the name here indicates where they might originate. So these come from vestibular nuclei. Uh, the tectum, if you remember the tectum, is the superior and inferior colliculus. The reticulospinal tract, uh, when we go through the brainstem, we'll talk about the reticular formation, but I did mention that briefly as an area in the pons and some in the midbrain that activates the brain. Okay, and then we have the anterior cortical spinal tract. So the vestibular spinal tract, again, originates from vestibular nuclei. There's a lateral and medial vestibular nucleus, and so we have a lateral and medial vestibular spinal tract. The lateral vestibular spinal tract is really important clinically. This is the major extensor upper motor neuron pathway. So uh, when you extend your arms and legs, a lot of that is the lateral vestibular spinal tract. And later on clinically, we will talk about something called decerebrate posturing, which is a really bad sign. It's something we see in unresponsive comatose patients 
where they spontaneously extend their arms and legs uh, has a bad prognosis, but the pathway involved in that is the lateral vestibular spinal tract. All right, the medial vestibular spinal tract um, communicates vestibular input, and vestibular input is what's going on, what the inner ear is sensing with regards to what your head is doing, the position of your head in space, and it sends that information only down to the cervical anterior horn cells. All right, so why do we need this pathway? Well, as you're moving around, shifting from side to side, um, your inner ears, the semicircular canals, are always sensing that movement, okay? And so you need to move your head very precisely with regards, or, you know, with regards to your posi the position of your head. So if you begin tilting to one side, you need to, you know, shift your head in the other direction. And so this is the pathway that allows you to do that. So just maybe an illustration here. Uh, someone slipping on ice. And notice the reflex here is to extend the arms. Okay, so that would be the lateral vestibular spinal tract. But if this individual were falling off to one side, um, again, the inner ears would sense the movement off to that one direction. And then the medial vestibular spinal tract would, would allow the individual to turn their head appropriately um, in the opposite direction. The tectospinal tract, again, originates here from the tectum, the superior colliculus, the inferior colliculus. So we're looking at the dorsum of the midbrain here. Here's the fourth nerve exiting right below the inferior colliculus. There's the pineal gland, the third ventricle, and the thalamus up here. Okay, and so the tectospinal tract, just like with the Vestibular spinal tract, more with proximal neck and proximal muscles. And the um, tectospinal tract, um, let's go back here. You remember that the superior colliculus has to do with vision, and the inferior colliculus has to do with auditory information. And so this pathway also, like the medial vestibular spinal tract, talks to the cervical anterior horn cells. Okay, so this has to do with neck turning, and so when you are able to precisely turn your head towards a visual stimuli or towards an auditory stimuli, that is the tectospinal tract. So for visual, it's coming from the superior colliculus. For auditory, it's coming from the inferior colliculus. So it has primarily that function, head movement with regards to uh, vision or auditory. All right, the reticulospinal tract comes from the reticular formation, mainly in the pons and some in the medulla. And this is an upper motor neuron pathway that supplies midline truncal musculature, more proximal muscles. All right, and then finally, the other, there are others, but so we're just going to stick with four that I'd like you to know. The anterior cortical spinal tract also is part of our medial medullary system here. And really, this is only the 10 or 15% of the cortical spinal tract that doesn't cross in the pyramidal decussation and become the lateral cortical spinal tract. It turns out, though, this isn't clinically that significant because these fibers here, once they travel down the medial uh, motor system, they actually do cross over uh, to talk to anterior horn cells on the opposite side. So the cortical spinal tract is really entirely a crossed pathway. Okay, and again, when you hear the term cortical spinal tract later on, think lateral cortical spinal tract with regards to the spinal cord. Now, please don't spend time going through each of these pathways. I'll just show you one. Here is the cortical spinal tract crossing at the pyramidal decussation, traveling through here. Right adjacent is the rubrospinal tract. I don't want you to try to remember which of these pathways are crossed and uncrossed, and um, that is not even in the handout. What I really want you just to appreciate as a big picture is that we have all of these upper motor neuron pathways that all have a somewhat different function, and so it makes sense that this, these, all these upper motor neuron pathways allow the brain to very precisely manipulate anterior horn cells in the spinal cord so that we can perform a wide variety of motor function accurately 
and precisely. Now, just to get some terminology, and when we have our clinical lecture on the spinal cord, we'll spend a long time on this. We've had a lecture on radiculopathies. Remember, that's, that's a lesion of the nerve root. The lay term is, I have a pinched nerve in my neck or back. But clinically, these are radiculopathies. Um, injury to the spinal cord is called a myelopathy. Okay, and as I mentioned, these can frequently co go together. This patient has a disc herniation um, here around C5, and you can see a narrowing, a focal narrowing there of the spinal cord due to pressure, and this white center right here is actually swelling in the spinal cord. And so this patient would have a disruption of some of these upper motor neuron pathways that we've talked about. So the patient will have upper motor neuron findings because of the spinal cord involvement, but roots are going to be compressed as well. And so at the level of the lesion, let's say C5 here, the patient is going to have some uh, focal lower motor neuron findings. Okay, maybe some deltoid atrophy, a biceps weakness and atrophy, loss of a biceps reflex. So again, um, the, the combination of upper and lower motor neuron findings from one lesion is unique. So we've said that the anterior horn cells are located right here. And so remember, this is the lower motor neuron in the spinal cord. Remember what a lower motor neuron is. It's just a neuron that talks directly to muscle. And we've got one neuron, uh, one axon from each neuron here going through roots, plexus, and talking to individual muscles. And so we can have lower motor neuron findings from something happening within the spinal cord itself. And so two conditions we'll talk about later, polio and West Nile virus, are two conditions that can kind of selectively knock out these anterior horn cells. So the problem is in the spinal cord, but yet you're going to find lots of lower motor neuron findings in that patient. Atrophy, fasciculations, uh, flaccid weakness, um, and so on. All right, this is a drawing that includes um, all of the pathways we've talked about, as well as a few we didn't talk about. Um, but I just kind of liked it because it showed here the ascending tracks in blue, the descending tracks in red. And you can see that, um, you know, I've kind of lumped these together. Uh, you know, there is a separation between the lateral cortical spinal tract and the rubrospinal tract. Um, but I don't care you know uh, those kinds of um, details. If, you're, if you just know what is the lateral motor system, what is the medial motor system, uh, we're not going to hair split about, you know, how close they are together or, you know, are we talking about the medial reticular spinal tract here or um, the anterior cortical spinal tract here? Just know the whole medial motor system. Now the ascending pathways are the spinal thalamic tract and the dorsal columns or the posterior columns. And because this pathway continues on in the brain as the medial lemniscus, this is sometimes called the dorsal column medial lemniscal pathway. Spinal thalamic tract doesn't change names from the spinal cord all the way up through the brain. All right, so let's first talk about the spinal thalamic tract. So these are pain and temperature fibers, again, that come in. They synapse and they cross over in this area of the spinal cord right here, which is called the ventral white commissure. Commissure is a crossing pathway here, and then it joins with the spinal thalamic tract. Okay, so here we can see at T3 these fibers coming in. Now they do ascend for a few segments, okay, right about in this location here. And this little ascending tract, which I'll show you later on, is called Lissauer's tract. And then we have the synapse, and then it crosses in the ventral white commissure, and then it is the spinothalamic tract all the way up to the postcentral gyrus. I emphasized here that it travels through the lateral medulla um, because when we talk about lateral medullary syndrome later, it's important that you remember that the spinal thalamic tract travels in the lateral medulla. And so you can imagine if a patient has a lesion in the lateral medulla, what's going to happen with regards to pain and temperature? Well, they're going to lose pain and temperature sensation in the opposite arm and leg. Okay, from there it goes up. Remember, anything except for smell has to go through a nucleus of the thalamus, so it goes through the uh, ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, uh, 
and then up to the post central gyrus. Now, um, in the early 1950s, um, all of these layers of the spinal cord were uh, subdivided, um, and they're called rext lamina, after the name of the individual who named these. And really, I would just like you to know, um, I think, two rex lamina. This is substantia gelatinosa right here, and um, pain and temperature does synapse in layers one and two, but layer two is most important. This has to do especially with pain synapsing here in the substantia gelatinosa. Okay, so you can see there are 10 altogether, 10 is around the central, and uh, the anterior horn cells are out here mainly in rex lamina layer 9. All right, now the dorsal columns, very important the distinction here that the dorsal column pathways, um, unlike pain and temperature, does not cross in the spinal cord. All right, so um, the fibers enter here below T6 and ascend, and so these fibers that come in below T6 we call the nucleus, uh, the fasciculus gracilis. They're going to synapse in the lower medulla as the nucleus gracilis. The fibers that come in above T6, we're going to call the fasciculus cuneatus. These are more lateral. They synapse in the lower medulla as the nucleus cuneatus. Okay, these fibers cross here as the internal arcuate fibers. Okay, so vibration and proprioception, and that's what's in the posterior columns here. These cross um, in, the, in the internal arcuate pathway here in the lower medulla. Remember that pain and temperature crosses down in the spinal cord as the ventral white commissure. Okay, so once these vibration proprioception fibers has, have crossed, we now call it the medial lemniscus, which like pain and temperature also goes through the VPL of the thalamus, and it's also going up to the postcentral gyrus along with um, pain and temperature. Okay, so remember, this does not cross in the spinal cord, whereas pain and temperature does. And when we're trying to localize lesions later on, this has a huge significance. <clears throat> All right, how does information get to the cerebellum from the arms and legs? Well, it gets there through the spinocerebellar tracts. Okay, and so there are two for the lower extremity called the dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tract. Two for the upper extremity called the cuneo and the rostral spinocerebellar tracts. Okay, um, I've worked very hard to try to cut out things that you need to know that I think are more for a PhD program or something like that. So I will ask you about the dorsal and ventral spinocerebellar tracts. You do not need to know the names of these pathways for the upper extremities. I just didn't want it to be magical, right? So there are two for the legs, two for the arms, but I think you would be much more likely to be asked on a board exam about the dorsal or the ventral. So let's have you know those. All right, so the dorsal spinocerebellar tract, um, again, this is from the legs. It's headed for the cerebellum, and this takes an unusual route here. Okay, it ends up going up through the posterior columns, right along with the vibration proprioception pathways. Then it synapses here in Clark's nucleus. And once we have the synapse there, it moves out and ascends to the cerebellum as the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. So notice it's lateral, the most lateral portion of the spinal cord here, uh, just lateral to the cortical spinal tract. Okay, the other pathway here um, is the ventral spinocerebellar tract. When we talk about the cerebellum, I'll explain some of the difference, differences of these two pathways. Um, the, the general rule for the spinocerebellar tracts is that they do this. They synapse in a nucleus, and then they ascend um, on the same side. There's no crossing, and then they talk to the cerebellum. Cerebellum needs to know what's going on in your arms and legs. This is how it gets that information. Okay, the ventral spinocerebellar tract is the odd pathway. Okay, so the, what, what triggers um, the information for the spinocerebellar tracts? Well, it's 
muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, and your arms and legs. Again, that those details we will explain later. And so in the case of the ventral spinocerebellar tract here, we have some maybe contraction of a muscle activates the Golgi tendon organ. Okay, and so that information then goes in, synapses, and so the ventral spinocerebellar tract is different because it crosses in the spinal cord, actually crosses here in the ventral white commissure right along with pain and temperature. It ascends all the way up to the midbrain, and then it crosses over a second time to the cerebellum. So it's unusual in that it crosses twice. So the net result really is that everything in your left arm and leg, for example, talks to the left cerebellum. Three of the four pathways do it without crossing. The ventral spinocerebellar tract crosses twice, but it ends up in the same place. Okay, And so that unique feature of the ventral spinocerebellar tract is worth knowing. Okay, So again, you only need to know about the ones for the legs, the dorsal, and the ventral spinocerebellar tract. And these are below T6, essentially. Uh, I do not expect you to know the cuneo or the rostrospinocerebellar tract, but these are for the arms. And so all of this information um, gets activated by movement in your arms and legs. And any movement is going to activate muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. So that is the source of the, the, the origin of this um, output to the spinocerebellar tracts. The 1A fibers are the fastest. 1B fibers are fast, but a little bit slower. So I highlighted here the only relay nucleus that I want you to know, and that is Clark's nucleus for the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. Three of these four pathways get to the cerebellum through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, when we get to the, mid the brain stem, we're going to show you that. We'll talk about it. Okay, the ventral spinocerebellar tract goes through the superior cerebellar peduncle. That connects the midbrain to the cerebellum. Okay, three of the four do not cross, and again, the ventral spinocerebellar tract is the oddball pathway. It goes through the superior cerebellar peduncle, and it crosses twice. Okay, so again, what do you need to know about this? You need to know the names of these two pathways, dorsal and ventral. For the legs, you need to know the Clark's nucleus and relate that to the dorsal spinocerebellar tract. And you need to know that the ventral spinocerebellar tract is unusual because it goes all the way up to the midbrain and gets to the cerebellum through the superior cerebellar peduncle, and it crosses twice. All right, so here is a section of the cervical spinal cord. So the dorsal spinocerebellar tract is way out here. The ventral spinocerebellar tract is in this location. All right, just a word about the autonomic system. Um, in comparison to the somatic motor system, and by that I mean voluntary movement, like coming from anterior horn cells, there's no ganglion in between the anterior horn cell and its supply of the muscles. But of course, the sympathetic system has these uh, preganglionic um, ganglia, prevertebral ganglia, the sympathetic chain ganglia in between, um, and the main thing I just want to emphasize now, because we have a whole lecture on the autonomic nervous system, is that the sympathetics come from this intramedial lateral cell column, which is mainly thoracic cord or extending down to L1, L2. So if you're, point, if you're asked to identify this, it's sympathetics. Parasympathetics come out from the sacral spinal cord. And when we talk about control of the bladder, um, it'll be important that we are able to contrast here the sympathetics in the thoracic cord and the parasympathetics down in the sacral uh, spinal cord. All right, let's talk about muscle spindles. Um, embedded within muscles in your arms and legs um, are these muscle spindles. They have contractile elements themselves, and so they are called intrafusal muscle fibers. The bulk of the muscle, when you think about a muscle like the biceps, that whole muscle is the extrafusal muscle fibers. These much smaller uh, fibers here are the intrafusal muscle fibers, equivalent with muscle spindles. Okay, And so muscle spindles have a nuclear bag right here and a nuclear chain right here. 
And the most important thing um, I think for you to know here is that within the nuclear bag we have these dynamic uh, fibers here. And they get the fastest neurons, the 1A neurons. And so this is what the what really triggers the dynamic bag fibers is any stretch, any small stretch of muscle. Um, is there anything we can do on exam to elicit that? Yes, check reflexes. When you tap on a tendon, it stretches the muscle. And that is a very potent activation of these dynamic bag fibers. All right, the nuclear bag static fibers and the nuclear chain fibers really work together um, more to do about the degree of stretch, not the change. Okay, the dynamic bag fibers have to do with any sudden little change in stretch. The, the nuclear bag static and the nuclear chain are essentially always providing the spinal cord with information about the degree of stretch, not so much the change in stretch. Okay, so most important clinically here is that the muscle spindles have to do with a rapid change in stretch and that these are, um, this is what happens, this is what's activated when you check reflexes on examination. Um, the nuclear bag static and nuclear chain, because they provide more of just a constant input, has more to do with muscle tone um, in comparison to the dynamic bag fibers. Okay, so again, don't forget, when we check reflexes, these are usually called deep tendon reflexes. They're really better called muscle stretch reflexes. Okay, when you check the biceps reflex, for example, you are activating the dynamic nuclear bag fibers and the fast nerves, 1A sensory nerve fibers. All right, so let's go over the reflex here a little bit. Um, you can see within the muscle here, you have these muscle spindles. Okay, and so let's tap on the patellar reflex. What happens? Well, you um, stretch the patellar tendon, which is going to stretch the quadriceps muscle. So that activates the nuclear bag dynamic fibers here in the muscle spindle. So this goes up through the dorsal root and it's very important here that you remember when you're checking reflex, this is a monosynaptic um, loop. Virtually everything else in the brain is polysynaptic. This is monosynaptic. So it goes directly from a muscle spindle to activate the anterior horn cell here in red that goes down to contract the quadriceps. So again, these are 1A, very fast, no synapses in between, and that's why the quadriceps kicks out immediately when you tap on the patellar tendon here. Now, there is more that happens, though. When you stretch this muscle spindle, it also goes through a little interneuron here, which has the function of inhibiting the antagonist muscle. Okay, so actually, we not only activate the quadriceps, but you inactivate the hamstrings, the antagonist muscle. Okay, so this is what happens with every reflex that we can check. We have a monosynaptic directly back to the muscle and a polysynaptic that inhibits the antagonist muscle. So again, reflexes to the agonist muscle are monosynaptic. And then we have this, what's called reciprocal inhibition to the antagonist muscle that is polysynaptic. All right, so again, there are contractile elements here uh, within um, these muscle spindles. And so that is important because these gamma motor neurons, Okay, these are located in the spinal cord, right adjacent to the anterior horn cells. They're in the ventral horn. Um, here we see these in red. Okay, so you want to imagine the green here is sending sensory information, you know, 1A, 1B, some two neurons to the spinal cord. The red here, these are going down from the gamma motor neurons to supply the muscle spindle. All right, and these gamma motor neurons are very important because they are constantly working to keep the muscle spindle tight, appropriately tight, so that it's always going to be very responsive to stretch 
um, with regards to whatever you're doing. Even if the muscle is contracted, if you're lifting weights or something, you still want that muscle to be very responsive to stretch. And that's a function of the gamma motor neuron. So here we have anterior horn cells or the alpha motor neuron. Okay, this supplies you know, the bulk of the muscle, the extrafusal muscle fibers. Right adjacent to it here, we have the gamma motor neurons. Okay, and these are talking to the muscle spindle. Okay, and of course, we've discussed the corticospinal tract and other upper motor neuron pathways that activate the anterior horn cells or the alpha motor neurons. Well, we also have upper motor neuron pathways that talk to, that regulate the gamma motor neurons. And so let's show this picture to illustrate why gamma motor neurons are important. Okay, here's the extrafusal muscle fiber supplied by an anterior horn cell. In parallel to that, we have a muscle spindle supplied by a gamma motor neuron. Okay, so let's say you contract your muscle. This is this middle section here is almost kind of a theoretical um, illustration to help you understand. So you contract the muscle. Now, the, the lines here indicate an action potential coming from the anterior horn cell to contract the muscle. Now, if we did not have gamma motor neurons, then what would happen here is when you contract the muscle, the muscle spindle gets kind of squashed. And now if you have a little stretch in the muscle, well, this is kind of flattened, and so it's not going to respond to a small stretch. Okay, and so again, just think of you're doing an athletic activity, and your muscle can't respond to stretch, you know, when you've contracted it. You know, you're going to perform that activity quite clumsily. So what happens here is when you contract the muscle, in parallel with that, the gamma motor neurons stimulate the muscle spindle to keep it tight. So now, even though the muscle is contracted, because the gamma motor neurons keep the muscle spindle tight, you're going to be able to respond precisely to any stretch that occurs in that muscle from its contracted state, because you've still got a tight muscle spindle. Okay, so that's an important function there of the gamma motor neurons. And so what happens here is we actually have co-activation of alpha and gamma motor neurons together. So every time the alpha motor neuron contracts the muscle, the gamma motor neuron is going to activate as well to keep the muscle spindle tight so that it is always sensitive to stretch regardless of how contracted your muscle is. Okay, so again, these are always working together in parallel um, as they get input uh, from upper motor neurons. Okay, what's the clinical aspect of that? Well, remember that spasticity, we said, is velocity dependent. Um, so when you try to, someone that's had a stroke, an upper motor neuron lesion, and their arm is kind of stiff, when you try to move it, if you move it fast, there's a catch. Why is that? Well, there are lots of reasons. There isn't one reason, but here's part of the explanation. These upper motor neuron pathways actually not only activate, but also inhibit. They keep in check this area of the spinal cord. So if we lose this upper motor neuron inhibition to these areas, let's just consider what happens if we lose inhibition on the gamma motor neuron because of the stroke. Well, now this gamma motor neuron is just sitting here. The neuron itself is healthy, but it's not getting this inhibitory uh, input from the brain. And so now it's overactive it's going to keep the muscle spindle very tight. And so in spasticity, um, part of the mechanism is that you have very tight muscle spindles. And so any movement, any stretch, overactivates the muscle spindle because it's overly tight. Okay, and so that is a feature of uh, spasticity. Okay, I'll mention a last thing here on uh, Golgi tendon organs, and then we'll take a break. So Golgi tendon or organs are located right at the junction here of muscles and tendons. They're in parallel uh, with these fibers, and uh, they send input to the spinal cord through 1B axons. And so um, these are the, the Golgi tendon organs organs, 
are very responsive to the state of contraction and tension in the muscle. So un again, unlike muscle spindles, which are mainly responsive to stretch, Golgi tendon organs are mainly responsive to the state of contraction and tension in a muscle. Right? And so here we have a Golgi tendon organ. Okay, here's the biceps muscle. And so if we just follow, um, here is uh, an anterior horn cell supplying the biceps and an anterior horn cell supplying the triceps muscle. And so when the muscle is contracted, okay, so again, the Golgi tendon organ is state, uh, sensing that state of contraction. Notice that this actually goes up. Okay, again, there's an interneuron. So this is polysynaptic, but it actually ends up inhibiting the agonist muscle. Let's say, you're, you know, again, you're contracting your biceps. Well, the Golgi tendon organ is actually a feedback loop to inhibit the biceps muscle and to activate the antagonist muscle. And that might seem counterintuitive. Why are we trying to inactivate the muscle if we are flexing the biceps? And so here we need to kind of imagine all of these upper motor neuron pathways that are talking. Um, you know, it's like the hands on a keyboard. It's, it's manipulating everything in the spinal cord to facilitate coordinated movement. And so why would you need that? Well, at very small levels of force, I mean, let's just say you're, you're writing with a pen right now um, or doing something like that. We are always activating agonists and antagonists simultaneously. Okay, it's not all or nothing very often. So at small levels of force, Golgi tendon organs are important for appropriately increasing or decreasing inhibition of anterior horn cells so that a steady degree of force is maintained. Okay, and so I was thinking of a procedure that I do. I inject Botox for patients that have blepharospasm and where their eyes um, involuntarily close. And so we inject several muscles, but we often need to inject right here on the eyelid. And that is, you know, requiring me to um, activate agonist and antagonist muscles at the same time. And so certainly the Golgi tendon organs would be important for, um, you know, having that degree of precise movement. At extremely high levels of force, you know, it can be appropriate to inactivate the agonist muscle to protect the muscle from damage. All right, so let's stop there and we will finish up next time.